Let us welcome our next Fireside Chat, hosted by Natalie Smolinski, with our special guest, Texas Senator John Cornyn. Senator, thank you so much for being here today. It's great to be back home. Yes, wonderful. Well, you know, it's it's perhaps an understatement to say that we are living in rapidly changing times. You know, last week, uh, Congress avoided a government shutdown. We just had a nail-biting debt ceiling vote and talks on this infrastructure bill continue to yo-yo. So in this context, can you give us a snapshot of what's on the to-do list for Congress in the coming months? Well, I just call it another day at the office. <laughs> okay. It's a lot of, lot of drama. Um, it's no secret that our country is pretty polarized politically, and um, so are our politics. And um, we now have a 50-50 United States Senate, which means uh, with the vote of the vice president, who can break ties, the uh, Senator Schumer is the majority leader of the Senate, Senate Speaker Pelosi who's a veteran, obviously, of many legislative battles. She's got a four-vote cushion to get things done. Ordinarily, what that would counsel, um, in my experience, is you try to find you know, the Venn diagram where the circles overlap and try to do the stuff um, in that space. But that isn't exactly what's happened. Um, you know, Republicans have not always been united. Certainly, we most recently sort of the Tea Party versus establishment, and now the uh, you see the Democrats uh, having this big battle over the progressives, who have a very aggressive agenda, but they don't have the political support um, to get it done. So we're looking for things to do together, uh, and some things that you know, like infrastructure, we were able to pass a significant infrastructure bill. Uh, with a large bipartisan support in the Senate. We were able to pass a, a bill called Endless Frontiers, which included a project I was working on with uh, Mark Warner, the senator from Virginia, a Democrat. We're both on the Senate Intelligence Committee. And when we saw what happened with COVID-19 and supply chains and started thinking about our vulnerability to uh, Asia on supply chains where 90% of the world's semiconductors come from, 63% of them come from Taiwan alone. That was like, oh my gosh, you know, how did we, how did we get in this position? So this is another area where we're working with the White House and, uh, and the House and the Senate to uh, fund, uh, to develop a fund that can be used then to uh, sort of level the playing field because these fabs uh, that uh, manufacture these advanced semiconductors are about 30% more expensive in the United States. But there's more than just who can be the cheapest provider uh, from a national security and economic security perspective. So those are some things that you might not hear that much about, which are actually positive. Uh, mainly you hear about the fussing and fighting and the national, the wailing and national teeth. Uh, but uh, some good is being done, and uh, I'm glad for that. Yeah, that's that's wonderful, Senator. Um, you know, restoring manufacturing capability to the United States. I've seen that topic increasingly, you know, come up for discussion and become more politically salient. So I'm really happy to hear that you've been leading on that issue. Well, I just let me interject. I, I tell people there's only two good things that have come out of COVID-19. One is margaritas to go, and, uh, <laughs> and the other is the other is telemedicine and uh, the, the, the access to health care that that promises. Of course, that then leads us to the broadband um, gap, and which we're very much involved in trying to solve along with our friends at the, the state legislative level. Yep, absolutely. You know, so um, some of this points to just how globalized, of course, our economy is, but we also now live in a multipolar world that has changed a lot since you first became a U.S. Senator in 2002. Um, what do you view as our biggest global threats today, and how do you think the United States should respond? Well, this won't be a surprise to anybody. China is at the top of the list. Um, John McCain, who I served with for a while, now deceased, a, a naval aviator, POW in Vietnam, everybody knows who John McCain is, once called Russia a gas station 
masquerading as a country because that's the source of its income, the oil and gas that it sells around the world. Unfortunately, they also have nuclear weapons, so they're not irrelevant. But China is something completely different and um, presents a lot of challenges. Uh, when they were admitted to the World Trade Organization, the, the, the expectation was that they would join the rules-based or international order and they would follow the rules. Well, they don't follow anybody else's rules. Uh, first, they steal all the intellectual property they can get their hands on. Um, secondly, they're very smart about investing in the United States, and particularly finding small startups that they can then acquire the IP and the know-how to use uh, to develop that in their own country. And of course, there's no line between the private sector and the military in, um, in China uh, by law. Uh, the military is entitled to get at it as a matter of law. And then there's just their very uh, broad vision around the world, like their Belts and Roads Initiative, uh, where they've made strategic investments in Africa and South America and elsewhere, um, and um, made in China 2025, where they hope to be a technological powerhouse, something like we are, or really, actually, they hope to, to, uh, to outpace us in that regard. But they've got a number of challenges, um, but uh, we, uh, we are paying most attention to, to China, but we also obviously have other big challenges from a national security standpoint. The aspirations of the Iranian uh, regime for nuclear weapons uh, and the destruction of Israel, among other things, and, uh, and North Korea, which is causing a lot of our Asian allies like Japan and, uh, and uh, uh, Australia and countries like India to form something called the Quad, which is sort of a, a counterpart to NATO to assure freedom of navigation in the South China and Indian seas, which is essential uh, to our world economy. So how do you think the United States should respond to meet these threats? So what, what kind of threats? So you just described, you know, the things we need to really be careful about, the threats okay. on the horizon. What, what do you think our policy approach should be? Well, the biggest, I mean, honestly, um, most, thank, thankfully, um, most of these countries are not interested in taking the United States on in a head-to-head -head military conflict. Conflict. Thank you. I'm grateful for that. But so what that means is most of the conflict is done through proxies. And uh, back to my semiconductor example, back in 1980, Jimmy Carter gave a speech in which he said that if any country were to block the Strait of Hormuz, which is the strait by which most of the world's oil supply used to flow, it would be the equivalent of an act of war. And the more I thought about our vulnerability to semiconductors, I thought if anybody blocked our access to those semiconductors, whether it's by pandemic or um, a natural disaster or military conflict, it would, it would be sort of the equivalent of uh, semiconductors being the new oil, I guess you would say. Um, but, you know, there's, there's no guarantee here again, thankfully, that any of this has to end badly in terms of conflict. What we need to do is be able to maintain deterrence, uh, what something Ronald Reagan calls peace through strength. If, uh, if, if nobody th thinks that they can actually win a war, then wars are much less likely to occur. Uh, but if they see vulnerabilities or uh, just... Uh, nonchalance so when it comes to some of these matters and that actually tends to be a provocation to, to uh, some of the authoritarians around the world including uh, some of the ones I mentioned yep absolutely you know and speaking of peace through strength that kind of brings me to Bitcoin and the, uh, the proof-of-work mechanism that um, establishes the integrity of the chain um, you know, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies have emerged as these non-state currencies that serve as an independent store of value for people around the world. How do you think that impacts U.S. foreign policy, and how do you think America should respond to that? Well, one recent example, the colonial, uh, colonial pipeline ransomware attack, where the ransom was paid in cryptocurrency, and then... Uh, through some mysterious method, which maybe we won't talk about in detail here. The FBI uh, found out uh, where the 
currency was located on some, some sort of wallet or some sort of repository and was able to recover uh, some of that uh, ransom uh, in the form of cryptocurrency. No secret that much of the cyber attacks like this uh, come out of Russia. Um, basically, if it's not, you know, Putin Inc., it's uh, the oligarchs and the criminal organizations that operate there with his knowledge and concurrence. And obviously, ransomware is enormously lucrative uh, if you can get away with it. So thanks to uh, some of our uh, folks who can operate only overseas, like the National Security Agency and Cybercom, they were able to get the, uh, the key um, to lock that uh, blockchain in order to get access to this uh, uh, cryptocurrency. So this really is a global phenomenon, and I think it's pretty exciting. Uh, Senator Lamas, who I know is going to be here later on, and Senator Sinema have created a, a, a caucus within the Senate to try to better educate members. And you might wonder, you know, what's, why is that important? Well, it's important because, for example, when we got an amendment that came across the, um, across the transom uh, on regulation of cryptocurrency in the infrastructure bill, uh, it was a little bit of a surprise. And when, when you surprise policymakers and policymakers aren't steeped in the, in the knowledge that's necessary to do this in the right way, then uh, some, uh, some bad things can happen. I know one of the great advantages of the crypto cryptocurrency is you can operate sort of peer-to-peer -peer outside of the normal regulatory scheme. But I think uh, the federal government is trying to figure out exactly you know, what to make of all this and figure out is this, uh, is this currency, is this property, is it a commodity? And if so, which alphabet soup agency of the federal government is going to uh, regulate. So that's where I would encourage all of you to uh, continue to engage with folks at the state and the federal level. Uh, certainly I'm always available to you and my staff as well to try to talk about what good policies look like rather than leave it up to us to make a big mistake and mess it up. Yeah, that's that's great. You know, and, and speaking of the role of the federal government, you know, what what do you see that role looking like um, when it comes to promoting prosperity in the United States and competitiveness on the global stage more broadly? Well, there's big there's a big debate. It's not a new debate in Washington D.C. and that is what is the proper role of government. Uh, here in Texas, I like to joke we believe in limited government. Government. That's why we have a. Um, 140 day sessions every two years. Uh, most Texans believing it ought to be uh, two days every 140 years. <laughs> but in Washington, uh, the government just seems to get bigger and bigger, and certainly during times of crisis like COVID 19, people need and expect the government to step up. And that's why we had to do some pretty extraordinary things from a public health standpoint and from a financial standpoint to prop through a lifeline to folks who are really struggling uh, tremendously and some businesses that uh, might simply cease to exist once we came out of COVID-19. But I, this won't surprise you. I think the, there's a reason why Texas continues to attract new business and entrepreneurs and innovators and now will be the, the ground zero uh, in the blockchain uh, cryptocurrency universe uh, because we do believe uh, in the freedom to innovate and actually um, nobody ever uses federal government and innovation in the same sentence. Uh, they're simply, you know, in opposite, in opposite. And so um, I think it, it takes, uh, it takes a hands-off uh, approach to the extent possible or at least a light regulatory touch to let the innovators create new and exciting things that we maybe hadn't even thought of or dreamed of before. And that makes this very exciting. Yeah, no, and, and speaking of uh, uh, light versus heavy regulatory touch, um, earlier this year, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen suggested that unrealized capital gains should be treated as income and taxed as such. Can you talk about the impact that would have on our economy? <laughs> and do you see a proposal along those lines gaining any traction in Congress? Well, I've seen some of the, I guess the IRS has uh, said that when you sell your cryptocurrency, um, that you're going to be taxed on the gain that you realized from your from your investment. Um, but 
if you can, if the federal government can tax you on the unrealized capital gains before you even sell it, that would obviously create a huge problem um, because you may not have the money to pay the taxes without selling your investment in the first place. And uh, it's really hard to know if you see some volatility, as I know is not entirely foreign uh, to the cryptocurrency markets, that um, you know, if, you, if, you're, uh, if, if your value is up here and, and you have to get taxed on the unrealized gain and then it goes down here, uh, is the government going to pay you back? Uh, I don't know. I just, I just think this is a bad idea from start to finish. And really it's part of what I alluded to earlier uh, between those folks who believe that the government ought to do more. And if the government's going to do more, then the government's going to take more of your, uh, of your hard-earned money in the form of taxation. And this is just another manifestation of that. Yeah, you know, I was, I was thinking if we start taxing unrealized gains, then I'm just going to start writing off unrealized losses and, you know, we'll pretty much break even. <laughs> That'd be a great trick. <laughs> um, awesome. Okay, what role do you believe the blockchain technology has specifically in building a future of prosperity for the American people? Well, I know a lot of the, a lot of the focus has been on the use of blockchain in, in the financial area of finances and financial transactions, but actually there's a lot of promise in the healthcare field, in uh, agriculture and trade, anywhere you need to have a secure uh, transaction. Um, and particularly, I think, in the healthcare space where you have uh, your, your own medical records that could be used, where this technology could be used to protect your privacy rights, but at the same time be able to share the information with the pharmacist, or your healthcare provider, um, should you wish to uh, to do so. So I just think um, we're just beginning to see some of the applications, and um, it's uh, again pretty exciting. But that's why I think it's so important that those of you who are invested in, interested in, uh, you know, cheerleaders for this incredible technology, to sh share with us as policymakers what you think the right approaches are because um, otherwise I think we're liable to uh, make some missteps and perhaps uh, discourage or um, eliminate some forms of innovation that would ultimately benefit everybody. Absolutely. You know, and, and thinking about Texas, this is, you know, after all the, the Texas Watching Summit, but what role do you think that the state of Texas has in ensuring that the United States as a whole goes in the right direction regarding Bitcoin? Well, we, you know, we Texans are pretty loud and we're pretty proud and uh, we always like to be number one. Um, and uh, so, but seriously, I think in so many ways, I think of our state as a role model for the rest of the country. And there's a reason why Elon Musk just decided to move his Tesla headquarters to Texas out of, uh, out of California, and why we've seen an increase in our population by 4 million people just since 2010. And if you uh, drive down the streets in Austin or try to buy a house here in Austin, you see the impact of that. It's uh, a, lot, a lot of new folks showing up, but I think they're showing up because they're leaving places that uh, are really uh, discouraging them from pursuing their dreams or that otherwise tie their hands by regulation or taxation. And uh, that's not our that's not our approach here. So uh, maybe the best thing that we could do as Texans is to show the rest of the country um, what success looks like and then they can uh, try to duplicate it. Yeah, um, exactly. So, you know, we've had some conversations here with, um, you know, people are concerned that maybe some burdensome cryptocurrency reg regulations could be coming down the pike um, at the federal level. So what would you suggest, you know, those of us who are active in this new economy, what should we be doing to promote responsible public policies that don't stifle the incredible innovation and job growth we're seeing across this industry? Well, I, I saw a couple of the folks from the Texas legislature here, and I think they've done some good things by establishing a working group uh, to begin to sift through and recommend good policies to the Texas legislature, but recognizing uh, this is not going to stop at state lines. This is literally 
uh, you know, interstate commerce, so it's within the federal government's bailiwick. But when I, I was encouraged when I when Peter Vogel, who I've known for many many years, suggested I come to this and thought this would be a great opportunity uh, to learn more. As uh, you know, every time I have to I come to something like this, I always get to be a little better informed, and hopefully that helps me do my job better. But also to work with people like Senator Lummis and Senator Cruz and uh, the rest of our colleagues. Um, but I think what we need to do is we need to stay engaged with one another um, because the most important uh, thing in Washington, D.C. is good information. It's the coin of the realm, and it's harder to get than you would think because there's so many different interest groups and there's so much going on there that uh, sometimes you're not sure you're getting the, uh, getting the gospel truth. Um, or unbiased information. So that's why I was excited about being here. Fantastic. Senator, do you have any last thoughts you'd like to add? Well, I would just say, um, I know I've sounded a little bit, bit like a broken record, but my career has um, mainly been in, in the legal realm. I was a judge for 13 years before I was attorney general. So I've seen the what, what happens in courtrooms uh, across this country. And I'm reminded of what happened back in I want to think roughly around 2000 when Microsoft got sued by uh, by the uh, attorneys general from most of the states and uh, for antitrust um, antitrust violations. Really, the the point of that is up until then I got the sense that Microsoft thought they could do what they did, which is amazing stuff and still is, um, and they didn't really have to interact with uh, government. But government will find you, and uh, you, you cannot escape it. So my, uh, my simple advice is to constructively engage with it. And uh, again, that's the reason I'm glad to be here today and why I look forward to continuing the conversation. Wise words from Senator John Cornyn. Thank you so much for being Thank with you. us.